Welcome to Hashing It Out, a podcast where we talk to the tech innovators behind blockchain infrastructure and decentralized networks. We dive into the weeds to get at why and how people build this technology and the problems they face along the way. Come listen and learn from the best in the business so you can join their ranks. Episode 23, Hashing It Out. As always, uh, I'm Dr. Corey Petty, and I'm here with Colin Couchet. Say hello, Colin. Hello, Colin. And today's guest is uh, somebody we've been trying to get a hold of for quite a while, uh, Dr. Emin Goon Sarir. And um, we brought you on to the Bitcoin podcast um, a long time ago. And when, you've been there multiple times, but the first time uh, you often you told us that no one calls you by Emin. And everyone just calls you by Goon Sarir or Dr. Sarir. Is that still true? Or I think some of your celebrity over the past couple of years has definitely had you people call, calling you Emin for a long time. You've just gotten used to it now? No, yeah, I've, I've, got, I've started to use it more and more often. Um, so uh, I respond to anything. I, I'll respond to, hey, yo, whatever else. Um, but, uh, you know, all my friends call me Goon. That's my given name. Yeah, the first name is a formality you inherit from your grandfather. So, uh uh, but it's okay. And uh, uh, the way I use it, actually, I, I, I can use it to tell apart the people who've met me from the people who have not met me. So uh, so people who haven't met me call me Emin, and people who've met me in person call me Gun. Um, if any emails start with Dear Emin, the, the spam filter is much more likely. <laughs> to be so that's a good, good trick. Uh, uh, well, now everybody knows that trick. So <laughs> we <didn't> announce it. <laughs> so uh, I, we brought you on to talk about a paper that just kind of came out of nowhere on IPFS regarding a, uh, a new consensus mechanism. And it, it's been known that you are, your distributed systems uh, professor, and you've been doing it for a very long time before Bitcoin. Uh, can you can you start to? And I, I think what we'd like to do is try and get both a bird's eye view of what this is and what its implications are, as well as a lot of some of the technical details and why it, how it differentiates itself from um, other consensus models. Sure, and of course you're referring to the Avalanche paper. Which that is was correct. A very very exciting paper to uh, uh, to hit the airwaves. Um, just to provide the big picture here, so um, the, the problem of consensus has been with us for a long time. It's a long-standing issue. It's at the core of almost every distributed system that people use, right? So all of the Google services have exactly the same issue uh, that Bitcoin and Ethereum and other cryptocurrencies face, which is Google has a bunch of servers. It would like to keep them in sync. This is a really big fundamental problem. Um, and uh, also from databases, you have a bunch of database servers, they store some data, you'd like to keep them in sync. Uh, or in distributed control, you have a bunch of machines, they'd like to take concerted action, they should all take the same action. That, once again, is a consensus problem. So the problem's been with us for at least uh, 40 years uh, that I can trace back. And uh, the early attempts were quite naive and, um, and were, were sort of ill-founded. And uh, there were a series of papers um, that sort of laid out the field and uh, established uh, the very first approach to this problem uh, back in the late 80s. So um, uh, the best known of those papers is uh, Leslie Lamport's uh, Byzantine Generals paper. And um, it's a fa fascinating paper and it laid out the field and it started this uh, style of solutions or family of solutions to the consensus problem that are sound. And uh, I call that family the Lamport-Liskov family. The two people behind it are Leslie Lamport and Barbara Liskov. And they both have Turing Awards for very, very good reasons. And they've done a, a huge, huge uh, service to the community by establishing this uh, area and by going into depth uh, into that particular family of solutions. And all of those solutions uh, rely on uh, all of us figuring out who should keep the data, you know, the set of nodes that, uh, uh, that are, are going to be holding our information, and then coming up with a read protocol and a write protocol for modifying the data and reading the data. So um, 
Uh, so, you know, these protocols are still in existence. They're used in every permissioned network. So Hyperledger, Corda, um, and uh, you name it, you know, uh, of course, Google's lock service, you know, uh, everything that you do ends up touching uh, one of these uh, uh, these classical protocols um, to uh, for consensus. So that's the one family. It started out in the late 80s and uh, has been hashed out to, to death, if you ask me. There are umpteen different variants of these, but they all come down to one fundamental sort of uh, mode of operation. Uh, we all have a quorum, let's say, just if you want a picture in your mind, uh, it would be kind of like a parliament, right? You have, uh, uh, you know, a parliament of, let's say, 100 senators, and then uh, you and I are supposed to, to 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 enact laws that everybody should agree on. So then what should the protocol be? Well, it turns out that there are some that work w well and can be proven, and they all operate by us writing to a supermajority of the senators or the, the nodes, and then reading from some subset of them to ensure that the set you write to and the set I read from always has a correct node in its intersection, or sometimes a, a plurality, a, a majority of correct nodes in its intersection, all depending on the fault model. So, uh, so okay, so that's sort of that. And, uh, and uh, just from the mode of operation, you can see that this approach will fail if you and I don't agree exactly on who the senators are, okay, on who exactly is in the room. So if you and I don't know who those people are, then we can, it's going to be an uphill battle ensuring that you and I have intersections of the right size in, in common. And if we don't have that, then all of the invariants break down, the correctness breaks down, and the protocols stop working. So they're very fragile. And by their mode of operation, they entail this sort of, a, a, of an almost a permissioning step. You, we all have to agree on who, who is going to be in the set of agreeing nodes or who's going to be the senators or who's going to be the nodes in the system. And therefore, it's kind of difficult to build something like a cryptocurrency, an open permissionless system based on these protocols. So that's why when the second family hit the scenes, it was a major breakthrough. And so that major breakthrough, of course, was done by one Satoshi Nakamoto, uh, whose identity we're still not very clear on. And uh, Satoshi was brilliant, right? He changed the problem in multiple different ways, and I can expand on those um, uh, if you guys want to. And uh, But the bottom line is he changed the, the way the protocol works. So in, instead of us having to know who's going to be in the system a priori, we now have this lottery-like system. We have these miners, and the miner gets you know, self-elected in, in some sense. He says, hey, I solved this really difficult crypto puzzle. You guys have to now bow down to me. I am the leader for the last 10 minutes of operation, and I will tell you exactly what should have happened in the last 10 minutes. That's approximately uh, how the Nakamoto consensus protocol works. So that was 2009. So where are we now? So we did 1989 was the first family, and it, it lasted a long time. Uh, 2009 was the second one with Nakamoto consensus, but Nakamoto has a big problem, and the the, the so, well okay, has a multiple problems. But the, the one of the biggest ones, of course, is the energy expenditure. The miners have to be co constantly hashing. There is no notion of efficient Nakamoto. It's by by design. It has to be inefficient. There is no downtime. You, the miners cannot be turned off. So, uh, so there is that problem. So it's not green, it's not sustainable. And, you know, some of the people in the Bitcoin circles might say, you screw the environment, why do we care? You know, let it burn or whatever. Um, so I, I don't subscribe to that, but some people do. Um, even if so, okay, so let's say screw the environment, let the, let the poles melt, you know, it's going to be nicer in Ithaca, New York, where I live, if that were to happen, actually. So um, even then, we would still have a big problem because money leaks out of the system. It has to necessarily leak out of your closed store of value ecosystem because you have to pay those people to burn that electricity. And that electricity has a very real, very tangible cost in the multiple millions of dollars per day. Okay, so, so that's not a very efficient way to build a store of value system. And further, of course, there are other problems with Nakamoto, such as the long latency for Bitcoin. It's 10 minutes to the first confirmation, 60 minutes to uh, something you can actually take, you know, you know take to the bank. Um, and, uh, of course, the limited throughput, which then leads to limited scale. So that all of that has been hashed out in great depth. And so the Bitcoin community has, you know, it used to be controversial to say that these days it's not because even the Bitcoin community has realized, hey, we have to go to layer two solutions to handle the scale problem. 
Um, so, so there are problems with both families. The first family, the classical, so the Lamport Liskov style, uh, was great, except it's not a good fit. It it requires permissioning, and um, the second family, the Nakamoto style, is wonderful itself, except you know it has it's not green, it's not sustainable, it's slow to first confirmation, slow to finality, and uh, is limited in scale. So Avalanche comes in uh, 2018. And uh, it's only the third such event uh, in history that I can I can uh, I can find, and um, and it introduces a new family, and it, that new family combines the best of both. And how does this new family differentiate itself? I mean, where where does the value come? Or how do you, how do you come into agreement by not doing the things you did previously? It's it's very difficult in my eyes to come to come up with such a system where it's open and permissionless for joining and leaving, yet you can be sure that you come to an agreement uh, relatively quickly and efficiently. Exactly. I think that's that's why this paper is so interesting. So the core uh, mode of operation for, um, for Avalanche is fundamentally different from everything that came before it. And um, for your audience, I think the easy way to summarize it would be it's gossip inspired. So uh, what that means is the mode of operation for this protocol um, has more in common with gossip style protocols than it does with anything else. The correctness does not stem from intersections and so on and so forth. Um, and uh, and so, so maybe the best way for me to describe it is to just sort of go into it and give people a sense of how it works. For, because, for a cl clarification, yeah. is this, is it, is it, is it flooding or is it gossip? Uh, it's gossip. Well, what's the difference? Well, okay, there is a slight difference between the two. Uh, flooding and gossip are very similar. Um, it is not a flooding protocol. It's really inspired more by gossip than by anything else. So uh, for, the, for the audience, again, flooding protocols are those where you have something to say and you contact all of your neighbors and you tell them. And then all of your neighbors contact all of their neighbors and they tell, tell them. So there's a wave front of activity inside the network as this thing disseminates through everybody. And um, so they are used, for example, they're used in Bitcoin to flood transactions. You want your transactions to get into the hands of the miners and uh, the peer-to-peer -peer -peer overlay floods that information. Uh, but they're used in all sorts of other settings. Flooding protocols are very, very useful. So routing protocols use flooding, right? Uh, so internet routing, uh, for example, uses announcements that say things like, I can get to CNN in two hops or whatever. I can get to this other destination in five hops. All of that information is flooded. Um, so in contrast, in gossip protocols, it's, uh, uh, there are different variants of them. Uh, but what you do is you know a bunch of people in, in the network. You have neighbors as before, but you don't contact all of them. You pick like a small subset and then they pick a small subset and so on and so forth. And, uh, and so, uh, so Avalanche happens to be in the latter category. It doesn't require you to contact all of your neighbors. You, co you contact only a small subset of them. Okay, great. And uh, I guess that like the, the decision-making process of how that message gets relayed across peer to peer, like as it, as it hops is, I guess, the differentiator between previous gossip, it's like gops, gossip inspired protocols. So, okay, so in, in gossip protocols, what you're trying to do is you're trying to get information into the hands of other people, okay? So, um, and that's a sensible thing to want. And uh, what you do, as I said, is uh, you pick a subset of people that you, you know, and then you tell them, and then they tell their friends and so forth. And if your network is, you know, of size N, uh, the dissemination will take log N steps, right? So why? Because... In effect, what you're doing is you're creating a random tree on the fly. Um, so just for the audience, just, you guys should know what they told me right before the show. They said, our audience is pretty technically sophisticated, so talk as you would to a normal colleague. So that's what I'm going to do. <laughs> so, but let me, uh, let me uh, slow me down if I, if I end up uh, saying things or using terminology. Yeah, that, uh, absolutely. That um, but what, what you're really doing in a gossip protocol is you're inducing a tree, a distrib distribution tree on the fly. I pick a couple of my neighbors, they pick a couple of their neighbors, et cetera, et cetera. And in log n steps, I'm going to reach everybody because a, a tree with, with height log n uh, is going to have two to the log n, you know, uh, uh, and that equals n uh, number of uh, nodes that I can reach. So that's all fine and dandy, but gossip protocols are not consensus protocols, right? So in gossip, the goal is to disseminate information. Um, and in consensus, 
I want to know that you know that we all will um, at the same time in some atomic, uh, in, in uh, incontrovertible fashion, commit this particular factoid uh, or commit this particular step in a state machine uh, transition. So, uh, so that there's a huge step in complexity between gossip, which is kind of like a communication protocol, and uh, consensus, which is an agreement protocol. It's, uh, uh, it's, it's going to be much, much, much more complicated to come to consensus than to just disseminate something. And just to be clear, so the differentiator between that is, is the ordering problem, is that correct? Um, so you can gossip all these transactions out there, but I mean, unless they know what order in which they're executing, then you don't really have a truth, a uh, single state across the network. Is there any way, is that kind of what's differentiating between Avalanche and a traditional gossip protocol? Right. Okay. Yeah, that's a good way to view it. Um, so uh, um, I think a simpler way to view it, I'll, I'll, you're right, that's one way to view it. So the simpler way to view it in my, uh, from my perspective is what happens when there are conflicting messages. So um, uh, in gossip, you will get to find out both of the messages, but you won't know which one to do. You, you don't, you know, do we attack at dawn? Do we not attack at dawn? We have to decide, right? And what did the leader actually say? Um, and that's, that's uh, something that gossip protocols cannot answer for you. And uh, in consensus protocols, at the end of the day, we will have chosen to attack or not attack. And all the correct nodes will either attack uh, en masse or they will back off and not attack again, all in in unison. So that's the that's the big difference. And you're right. If we could, if if everybody had had could see the same order, then uh, in effect we would have achieved some kind of decision between the two. But because these are independent machines um, operating at different speeds, seeing the the messages in different orders, um, then uh, and subject to different Byzantine behaviors by by participants in the network. They, uh, they might come to see or perceive a different order uh, if we just use a simple gossip protocol. So, um, uh, so that's the big difference. Gossip will just give us the info, but will not order it, will not determine the, the, the true, true chosen uh, decisions, whereas a consensus protocol will decide, okay, this is what happened. Of the two conflicting things you heard, the one that we're going to pick is this one. Okay, so we have consensus protocol is basically... Um minimizing the difference between local state and global state and that has to come through some type of decision making process on the on the local level how do you how do you do that yeah that, that's that's exactly the question so as i mentioned uh we used to know only two ways of of achieving consensus one was uh the classical style the lamport liskov family of protocols the other was nakamoto and then comes avalanche and i'll tell you how avalanche works it's very very simple and uh, unlike Nakamoto, which takes a while to figure out, and uh, unlike Lamport Liskov, which also takes some reasoning and, and, and some math to figure out, uh, Avalanche is very, very straightforward. So here is how it works. Imagine that you, me, and uh, you know, everybody else are in a giant crowded stadium, okay? We know roughly who's in the stadium, but we don't know everybody who's in the stadium. And you might actually know that there are, you, know, you, might, you might know of 5,000 extra people that I don't know about, I might know of, you know, 5,000 extra that you don't know about, and that's, that's going to be okay for this protocol. That's one of the magic, awesome features of it. So suppose we're in this really, really large stadium. Suppose Maracaibo Stadium in Brazil, right? This is the biggest it gets. I think it's 100,000 people. So there we are, and, uh, and we'd like to come to an agreement. And, um, and so these agreement protocols um, are difficult, right? So there will be people in the stadium who might want to trip us. They might, they might tell us one thing and tell our neighbors something else. They might flip and flop. We will call them Byzantine, uh, Byzantine actors. Um, or if you want to think of them as trolls, or that's fine too. So well, you want to come to a decision. And here's how Avalanche does this. And suppose the decision is we want to pick a color, okay? We want to pick between red versus blue. Okay, that's that's our decision. It's abstract. Um, think of it as uh, well, whatever. There's just think of it as confirming a transaction, if you will. But well, you know, let's not. Let's just actually go with the color of, um, analogy. So we're going to pick between red and blue, and imagine that everybody has a red card and a blue. In fact, one card with red on the front and blue on the back, and everybody initially puts the cards on their forehead uh, with with their preferred color standing out. Right. So what's going to happen? Well, the following is going to happen. In the very first case, 
uh, in, at step zero. Let's suppose that we have the, the reds and the blues distributed around our stadium uh, equally. So we have a 50-50 split and there's like a mixed up people and you know half of them have reds facing up and half of them have blues facing up. Our goal is to do some magic and at the end of that magic, we want, we, we want people to pick one of them. So here is how Avalanche's magic works, okay? It works as follows. Every node asks just a very small number of other nodes what color they have on their forehead. That's it, okay? So I contact, let's say, five other people in this ginormous stadium. I just pick five. And I say, yo, what color do you have on your forehead? And back come the answers. And, and the answers are going to be something like red, red, blue, red, blue. And um, let's say. And so if that were to happen, the, the majority looks to me like they're picking red. All I do is as a correct node, based on the answers I'm hearing from the audience, based on the fact that everybody seems to be going towards red, I add my weight to red. So I flip my own card to red. That's all. That is as simple as this protocol gets. In fact, that's as simple as any consensus protocol gets. So, um, so what does this accomplish? Well, it creates a meta-stable environment, right? It creates an environment where the protocol is highly unlikely to remain in this, uh, in this bivalent state, okay? So that bivalent state is the state where it could either pick red or blue, that 50-50 division, that's bivalent. It could go either way. And um, uh, so this, this process of trying to, for everybody trying to put their weight on the same side uh, creates an, a, a, a sort of an inherently unbalanced situation, what we call a metastable situation. So metastable, metastability is great. That's exactly what you want. Uh, in um, in a consensus protocol, you don't want the, the the nodes waffling and flipping and flopping in the middle of the road. You want them pushing their weight towards one decision or another. And so, in Avalanche, what's going to happen? Okay, well, so so we started fifty fifty. There were fifty thousand people with red on their foreheads and fifty thousand with blue, and uh, and everybody asked their five chosen friends what color they had. And uh, and at the end of the first round something interesting will happen. Now, what is that? Well, we're not going to achieve this, a decision in one round. Then not everybody talks to everybody, and, and it's, it's impossible to, uh, to achieve a proper decision by then. But um, at the end of the first round, okay, what's going to happen is really interesting. We will have oversampled either the reds or the blues. So in my example, I ended up oversampling the reds. And, uh, you know, we have 50, well, we have 100,000 people doing this in tandem. And, uh, and at the end of the first round, you know, depending on how the random die tosses come out, or depending on who they, the, which random friends they chose, uh, we will end up with a situation that's, uh, that's going to be most likely 51% red to 49% blue, or vice versa. I don't know which way it's going to go, but the chances that it's going to remain in balance are minuscule. Right? So that's, that's incredibly unlikely. Much more likely is the, the transition towards one, uh, the left edge or the right edge, like an oversampling, an overrepresentation of reds or blues. And suppose after the first round, we, we veered towards red, okay? So then what's going to happen after the second round? Well, the chances that we're going to go towards the red is much, much, much higher. After a second round of this, this exact same process, there were 51% reds in the audience. So the chances of converting people to red are much higher, 51%, than converting somebody to blue, which is 49%. So, so that process is going to self-amplify. So at the end of the second round, we would expect, you know, I'm making numbers up here. They're not, you know, I'm rounding things up. But the uh, chances are that we'll find ourselves in a 53-47 split. We will have gone towards red even more and we will get faster and faster towards that destination. And then the third round, of course, we go more deeply into red territory until we reach a point uh, that we call the point of no return. And past that point, everybody will commit. It's safe to commit. You know that the entire uh, stadium will be the same color. So uh, the math in the Avalanche paper shows that for very low periods of, uh, of uh, for very low numbers of rounds, so on the order of 13 or so, um, you can achieve consensus in very large networks. So 
Uh, going back to our example, I think, uh, what was it, Maracaibo Stadium, 100,000 people. I think the number is something like 15 or so. Uh, so after 15 rounds of this, all you're doing is you're, you're sampling five friends of yours, okay? That's all you're doing. So at the end of the protocol, you will not have spoken to everybody in the stadium. To the contrary, you will have spoken to five times 15. What's the number? That's uh, 75, I think. So you will have spoken to only 75 people and yet, you look around the stadium, and this is the magic, everybody will be holding up the same color card against their forehead. And that's why I think it's so cool uh, that this thing operates in a fundamentally different fashion. It's much more efficient in the way it works, and, uh, and it gives you very, very strong guarantees. Um, with a fine-tuning uh, knob under the, the hand of the, under the thumb of the, the system designer, you can change how many rounds you go for, you can change how many people you sample to ensure that, uh, you know, whatever level of whatever probability of reversion uh, you're comfortable with. This is equivalent if you want a comparison. In Bitcoin, you have the number of confirmations um, and the, the higher that number is, you know, it's six versus, you know, five versus six versus seven. The, the longer you wait, uh, the better it is uh, in terms of uh, what the likelihood is of it getting undone. There are similar controls in Avalanche as well. So it's so, a really cool protocol. Yeah, that sounds really. It actually kind of reminds me of the uh, brown eye, blue eye problem. It's a logic puzzle that's actually been featured on XK, uh, XC Kitty, whatever it is. Um, and it sounds a lot similar to that kind of that kind of problem set and that solution. And um, it, it's neat. But um, my question is, that works great with red versus blue. But what if there's 18 colors? Um, and you know. Um, some of them qualify and some of them don't. Um, and like, if you have a, a stadium full of very many different pieces of conflicting information, the number of rounds it would take to come to consensus, it, it seems would significantly increase. But also, there's the possibility for maybe chaotic states where everything kind of half the audience flips and half the audience doesn't flip. You know, or I guess eventually it would kind of come to a consensus, but. It would just take significantly longer if there's multiple pieces of conflicting information. Is that correct? Um, not really. So the number of outstanding competing proposals uh, is not really germane to uh, to how long the protocol runs. Um, it doesn't matter. So imagine the same same situation. Okay. So imagine that we had three colored cards: red, blue, yellow, and um, and instead of a fifty fifty split, uh, I don't know what you want to have. Let's say. Uh, uh, you want to have a one-third split for each color? That's fine, too. Uh, maybe, actually, just, just take the following example. Imagine three different decisions, uh, red, blue, yellow. Uh, let me illustrate with, the, with, the, with a very simple-to-see example. Uh, imagine that yellows are 1%. Okay? In one round, they will be wiped out, right? There will be no more yellows. So, um, so that's, uh, that's kind of interesting. Um, and if you start out in a one-third, one-third, one-third scenario, which is the worst case for three colors, well, then quickly one of them will, uh, will dominate, yeah, right? So the reds will, will uh, veer over the one-third boundary. And, uh, and then they will again go into that same metastable uh, process and, uh, and will veer you know, in that, that direction. So, um, in fact, the presence of more things to choose from makes it strictly easier for the protocol to decide because the, the other correct nodes get divided and, um, and therefore uh, uh, the, the self-reinforcing stuff works uh, even faster for, for the case of more, um, uh, more, uh, uh, more colors. Uh, but you're okay, right about, about, you're right about one thing, Colin. Let me, let me mention what you are right about. There is a, there, you, you have a, a very insightful thing that, that I don't want to lose, which is it is possible for this protocol. Um, so, okay. It is not possible for this protocol to have a safety violation, okay? So that's one of the things that's proven in the Avalanche paper. What it says is, if you pick red, the chances that I will pick blue are minuscule, so small that I don't need to worry about them. It's, in fact, they are so small that they can be made smaller than the chances of all of the oxygen atoms in this room just migrating to the other side, leaving me to suffocate just in pure <laughs> nitrogen on this side of it, right? So that, that can happen. It, it is possible, right? We live in a probabilistic universe. Uh, these uh, atoms are colliding with each other. Some of them go left, some of them go right. And uh, they could easily actually do this. Not easily, but they could do this. This is a possibility. It's just incredibly unlikely. We choose not to worry about this. And I, as far as I know, nobody has 
died of uh, <coughs> nitrogen and you know, due to <laughs> random brilliant, I mean, probabilities work. Yes. So, um, so, so for that reason, um, uh, so okay, so so safety violations in avalanche are incredibly unlikely, but uh, but there is one scenario which is if you have a sizable attacker, okay, so you have an attacker that's uh, commanding, let's say, twenty percent of the nodes in the network, then unless you manage to break out of that initial 50-50 split, he can keep and 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 he knows exactly what he's doing. And he, he, he can see everything inside the network. He knows exactly how people are proceeding. Then he can keep you in that zone before you start to fall off on the edges. So the protocol, this particular protocol, um, does not guarantee liveness um, for, uh, uh, for decisions between uh, conflicting transactions. So, so that's a mouthful, and I can expand what that means. But uh, for normal mortals, what it means is if somebody's trying to double spend, Okay, and uh, and he launches an attack with his double spends at the same time. So uh, so that is I issue two transactions, one paying Alice, one paying Bob. I also at the network level, using a lot of resources, um, I launch a, a large attack that requires me to see what's going on. Then the paper very nicely says, look, in that case, the attacker can keep these both of these decisions from making progress. So we neither pay Alice nor we pay Bob. And, uh, and then, but then the paper says, look, this is of no consequence because of this other construction uh, that, uh, that decisions of this kind that are stuck in limbo, limbo have absolutely no effect on other decisions. They're all independent. So if I ever do this to you or to Alice and Bob, let's say, uh, then uh, you guys paying each other is completely unaffected. So, uh, so it's a very nice thing. Um, so, you know, at a higher level, in every, yeah. but let, in me, practical, let me just complete that. this thought. Let me just complete this thought. I, I just, just kind of a cute, cute thing to, to mention. You know, in every distributed system, you're going to have some badness. Like there's some impossibilities that are always going to have to be there. And these protocols, like both Nakamoto and classical, you know, there's always like some badness that you need to deal with. Like classical breaks down when you have you know, uh, uh, bad actors over a certain threshold. Nakamoto has other issues. In this one, in Avalanche, all of the badness, all of the sort of the, you can't get rid of this, you got to pay some price at some point, um, is all collected into a tiny ball. And that ball is placed squarely on the shoulders of anybody who's trying to cheat the system. So if you're trying to cheat the system, then the system doesn't guarantee anything for you. And so, and that's good <laughs> because you were trying to cheat the system in the first place. It, it's not going to guarantee anything for you. But uh, for everybody else who wants to uh, to assure that their transaction got committed, uh, it provides a strong safety guarantee and provides a strong liveness guarantee. So can I posit a situation where that might in reality become an issue? Uh, maybe I'm wrong about this. Let's say, let's say a coalition of the nation states want to embargo um, a smaller nation state. Um, yeah. and they collect together and you know redirect all their ha all their all their hash powers. That's the word. All their um, <laughs> yeah, all their hash um, power is a, is a thing of the past. Yeah, yeah it's, it's, uh, it's uh, they redirect all the all the network traffic and basically Great. say, hey, look, this is this is from now on. We're going to um, we're going to block any transaction that tries to go through the network from this particular set of IP ranges. Um, right. And uh, we're going to do this on the state level. And what we're going to do is basically say uh, we control 20% of the hash, uh, again, the calculation power. I don't know what you call it, transactional validation power on the yeah, network. Yeah, decision power. Let's call it decision power. Okay, decision power on the network. So we're going to constantly flip from red to blue um, every time they try to confirm. And so nobody on the network can ever um, validate their information. Um, is that not a potential like network level threat for this particular protocol? Yes, that that is a threat. So uh, let's go through what can happen in response to that threat. So um, just like the fifty one percent attack is a is a potential attack on Nakamoto, um, I think uh, so. Okay, so let's uh, you know of course Avalanche is going to have a number of attacks possible against it. So let's go over it once again. So uh, twenty percent is a rather small number. So eighty percent can easily. Uh, pull pull ahead of um, of uh, of people 
who are um, uh, who are trying to do this. Okay, so uh, let's let's just back up. Um, okay, let's back up and let's start from scratch. So the um, if you have a network where the the majority of the nodes are committed to the proper functioning of the coin, okay. So just like uh, just like in Bitcoin, you assume that 51% is honest. Uh, in a similar context here, we're going to assume that the majority of the nodes um, are, in fact, let's assume a supermajority just to make it simple for the discussion here. Assume a supermajority that are committed to, to seeing, seeing transactions through. If the person doing the spending is not trying to cheat the system, these people have no chance, okay? So that... Uh, uh, if, if it's me and I'm spending, I'm giving money only to Alice, then there is nothing they can do to stop it. So this is an interesting result. It's non-trivial, but, uh, uh, but it is, uh, you know, it's, 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 very, it's very, very, very cool. So how, how is this possible? Well, very straightforward, in a somewhat straightforward fashion. If I'm not issuing double spends, I'm doing virtuous transactions. I'm actually just genuinely paying Alice then that transaction will disseminate to all, let's say, 80% good people. And 80% will say, well, look, I see no reason to reject this transaction. It's signed by, you know, whoever, and, uh, and it should get to its destination. There is absolutely nothing that that 20% can do to counteract um, a group as large as, uh, uh, as, as the 80% of the network saying this should go, go forth. So, um, so that case is pretty straightforward. Now the second case is gets to be esoteric, complicated scenarios, uh, but again they will come down to, um, uh, to to scenarios that have no consequence for anyone except the attacker. So, um, if you have a group that's dedicated to uh, to sort of creating a liveness problem, they can only do that if there is a con there is a conflicting set of transactions. If I'm paying Alice and Bob at the same time, they can hold it in limbo. And that is not, that is, in, in, okay, let, let's actually contrast this with Bitcoin. In Bitcoin, A miner will pick one of those two, okay? It'll get resolved. Um, but in Avalanche, somebody could pick, could, could, somebody could launch an attack where they maintain the network in perfect balance between Alice and Bob for a long time, maybe, okay? Let's, I'm giving the attacker a lot of power in this discussion, and I'm, I'm going to get to that in a second, uh, because real attackers will not have this much power. But, but the main point here is, okay, so for, you know, for an intellectually advanced audience, we have, to, we have to just be clear that, you know, this protocol is different. If there are conflicting transactions, it doesn't guarantee liveness. So it differs from Nakamoto. But there should never be conflicting transactions as long as the issuing person is honest. Why the heck do I have the same UTXO spent both to Alice and to Bob? Why is it that I'm sending the same coins to two different people? So I should never have done that. And if I do do that, then the attacker um, can hold us uh, in limbo. And if they do, then, um, then they do. And, and, and what's the consequence of that? The consequence of that is felt only by me. It doesn't hold up block production. There is no such notion of, of a linear blockchain in Avalanche. It creates a, a, a directed acyclic graph. Yeah, I was wanted to, so, I wanted to point that out because it's it seems as though um, in the case of Avalanche, it's a type of consensus protocol that um, runs in parallel, like a directed acyclic graph would. And so you have the resolution of denial of service for single transactions, which doesn't withhold the denial. It doesn't have a denial of service on the entire network like you would with a block producing blockchain, right? Like if you ha if yeah. you can deny a single double spend, it could potentially have problems or consequences that spread across all of the transactions of the network. But with when you have a resolution that's so, so fine grained on the message level, those who are trying to attack the system only have denial of service issues or, or like, you know, uh, or, or issues with people coming to consensus on that transaction while not having an effect on anything else. So good quality or good behaving transactions get through without having to care about what other people are doing to deny service. That's exactly right. The system will just route around it in some sense, right? It's creating this graph, and uh, suddenly the graph will have a node that splits into two. And as long as the attacker is, is launching that attack, keeping it maintained, then the system might actually be in limbo and might be unable to decide. And this, again, just like you said, Corey, uh, we, the rest of the graph will grow around those nodes, and the system will proceed at full capacity, 
and uh, the guys in limbo will just remain in limbo as long as the attack is in progress. And uh, uh, if the attacker ever slows down for whatever reason, the system will actually pick one of the competing transactions and will actually resolve it. So that's not a problem. And, um, uh, and of course, there is another open issue, which the paper doesn't actually advance uh, enough, in my opinion. Um, and, uh, but, you know, everybody who's looked into it, including my group in depth, uh, says that there is lots of extra work to be done and lots of interesting things to, to examine um, in the following scenario. Well, what exactly is an attacker capable of anyway in Avalanche? So the Avalanche paper says, let's, let's assume an omniscient sort of NSA style adversary, an adversary that can see what everyone else is seeing, an adversary that can look at who communicated with whom, who told what to whoever else and so yeah. forth. And that's not that's not actually realistic. Even NSA is actually NSA can tap wires, but they they won't necessarily know who, uh, what the communication is. We're going to use uh, end to end um, encryption in, in Avalanche. So 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 that the the paper is just giving a lot of powers to to this crazy adversary, this this mythical adversary. A realistic adversary is not going to know um, exactly what's going on on each node. It's, it might have a statistical idea because it itself can poll, uh, but it won't know exactly what's happening. So as a result, um, we're in a very interesting situation. I think uh, it, it's, you know, even with large, large numbers of nodes, adversaries might get overtaken. So um, uh, in any case, these are all esoteric academic uh, sort of, uh, uh, you know, diversions from the main point, which is this thing is, 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 is bulletproof in terms of its uh, safety guarantees. And, uh, and its liveness guarantees are also bulletproof uh, as long as nobody's misbehaving. And now we are, we're kind of like, uh, we're going into depth on what happens when people misbehave um, with attackers that uh, are trying to sort of do things at the same time. So it's a very esoteric point. I didn't want to get the audience confused about this. Uh, almost every avalanche discussion kind of devolves into this because for a distributed systems geek, this is these corner cases are the interesting ones. Mm -hmm. But the main ones, like the main usage of this network is going to be I pay Alice and Alice waits for my, uh, my transaction to pervade through the network. And uh, she pulls a whole bunch of times. And at the end of that, she is convinced that everybody has seen this transaction and nobody will revert. And that's the end. Um, so it's a fascinating, very, very quick process. Um, so so the, the protocol in practice ends up achieving finality in a, in a matter of a second to, to a second and a half for really large networks. And, um, and it has throughputs on the order of tens of thousands of transactions per second. So it's, uh, it's really an exciting area. Uh, it can do things that other people cannot do. And, uh, and my group is currently busy building a new coin on top of the Avalanche, the core Avalanche uh, consensus protocol. Um, and, uh, and, and there are fascinating things one can do on top uh, that one could only dream of with other, other coins. I had, a, I had a question about, um, I feel like a lot of this is, at least in terms of the corner cases we talk about with adversarial settings, is the choice in how you randomly sample your own friends to ask questions. Like you have to assume that that sampling is done well because you have a large enough like coalition that can basically lie to everyone else. But if you can sample appropriately randomly, then I feel like that it mitigates a good a lot of the power that a that uh, I guess adversary would have. Right. You should use a good random number generator. Um, the the interesting thing though is uh, you don't you know it's it's uh, uh, the random number generation is up to you, and uh, um, you know it's uh, I don't know it's uh, it's it's fairly straightforward in 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 how it would work, right? You you just pick any sort of um, any any good random number generator, the one that comes with your OS these days is good enough, and uh, and then you sample according to that, and that'll get you the the diversity that you need. So it just has to be unpredictable to the attacker. The avalanche, yeah, I think, sure. is a really appropriate name for how uh, how how fast this grows because like it, it, the decision making yeah. process is very exponential. Right. Exactly. Exactly. You start going slowly away from the midpoint, and then suddenly you just avalanche down like in a in a giant mass. That's exactly right. So I, I'm still stuck on edge cases, and I just got one more to get out. I know there's sure. probably something you've already addressed, but um, there's a backdoor in Cisco routers. Um, and they, you know, somebody exploits that and winds up being able to manipulate the network so that transactions that are posted aren't the transactions that were intended. 
um, with blockchain, there's like an audit trail. You can kind of you know, sign things and have intent as part of the network. Um, yeah. With this, it doesn't seem like that's the case. You can't broadcast actual intent. You're not actually proving that you intended to do this one and only this one thing. Um, is that actually an issue or am I just you know, coming up with something that's kind of too wacky for, for reality? Um, it sounds a little confusing to me. So how would you, well, how would you signal intent in Bitcoin? Like if you issue a transaction, um, you know, that that's a transaction in Bitcoin, right? There is no, mm -hmm. there is no notion of, well, I'm doing this payment, but I didn't really intend it in Bitcoin. So, um, so why should there be a similar, uh, you know, why, why, why should Avalanche mm -hmm. do something that Bitcoin doesn't do? Mm. Guess you're right. Okay. So cool. So uh, what is the progress you're making on actually building out this coin? Ah, so that's a great question. So uh, consensus protocols are fantastic building blocks, but they are not by themselves a coin, right? The coin system actually requires a gazillion other decisions and, and a lot of exciting new architecture on top. So um, at the moment, I'm building a new coin. It's called Ava. And... Uh, we uh, created a company to sort of take over the, the development of this, and, um, and we're sort of proceeding quite uh, fast down the path of building a, a fantastic new platform. I'm really excited about this, and uh, let me try to give you the high-level bits. So the Ava coin um, that we're building is based on Avalanche, and uh, it takes advantage of the Avalanche consensus protocols uh, protocol, and um, it then... Uh, as a result, inherits all of the good features of Avalanche. So what does that mean? Our time to finality is less than two seconds. So that's pretty a good starting point. So within two seconds, you have as much assurance as one would after, I think the math, what did we do? I think it's on the order of 50 confirmations in Bitcoin or something like that. It's the chances of it being reverted after two seconds are, are minuscule. Um, so uh, that's, that's our starting point. So that's finality. Um, our throughput is on the thousands to tens of thousands uh, of transactions per second, depending on the complexity of the transaction. And um, that's the throughput. It, and we're green. So if there's nothing to do, then we, we can just sit there without consuming any energy. There is no notion of constant energy expenditure. We're not going to consume the uh, entire energy input of Denmark. Um, just so people have some idea so they can visualize it. Um, cryptocurrency mining takes approximately two nuclear power plants entire net output. So I'm sure everybody has driven at some point next to a giant nuclear power uh, plant. These are really, really big, very impressive uh, constructions. And uh, two of them, you know, imagine all those cooling towers and, and all that stuff. Two of them are being used worldwide at the moment for confirming cryptocurrencies. That's way too much, way, way too much. And it's that energy could be used for anything else. If you can't do anything, smelt aluminum, uh, you will have at least uh, accomplished something. So, uh, so we can achieve the same level of security as uh, existing cryptocurrencies, or in fact, higher than that, and, uh, and not require a, a tiny fraction of the electricity that's going into cryptocurrencies. So that's, those are the cool features um, of, that we inherit from Avalanche itself. Uh, but there are other things we're building on top that are really exciting, and I want to just get, get through them very, very quickly. So number one, um, Avalanche is not going to be a single coin platform. Yes, there will be a single coin, Ava, uh, that will fuel the whole system. That's true. But in, in, in uh, conjunction, there will be the ability to create any number of coins on top. That's going to be pretty exciting. So uh, most people are somehow in this one coin, one chain mentality. And... Uh, and so we thought critically about it. There's absolutely no reason why we can't support multiple different coins. So you want to start a new coin that represents real estate transactions that have unique properties. You know, you can merge them if they're next to each other and so forth. Then, uh, then, uh, uh, then you, you can do that. Um, or, uh, you know, you want to represent gold on the chain, um, on the graph in this case. Absolutely, you know, and gold has other unique um, properties, like if it's in the same vault and same bar, maybe you could uh, combine it and da, da, da. So all of those kinds of special features we could, we could support. In addition, uh, we will be able to support, and we are able to support even now, multiple scripting languages. 
So there's going to be a base scripting language that is simple and uh, safe and secure that anybody can count on. But you could introduce a Cori coin with its own unique scripting features. Or you like, you know, let's say you like Monero's uh, anonymity features and you like the, the Bitcoin, uh, you know, whatever, uh, the Bitcoin scripting language, you could combine them. Absolutely uh, easy to do in, the, in our language. So, um, uh, so those are nice. Um, let's see, what else can you do? There are a lot, but a lot of other things one can do on top. Um, the coin itself, the parameters of the coins itself, um, uh, of the coins themselves, uh, are subject to governance. So, one interesting thing you can do with Ava that you can't with other coins is use the the underlying consensus mechanism to poll for social consensus. And so, what does that mean? Um, so, you know. In the design of every coin, there will be certain numbers, certain parameters that are absolutely crucial and that are hard to guess for the system designer. So let's take, for example, Satoshi Nakamoto. He ended up, you know, one of the parameters was how many coins shall I have outstanding? 21 million. Okay, that's easy. And that's that's okay. Like once you pick any number, it's, it's as good as any other. As long as it stays constant, that's fine. And then he picked the minting schedule. Mm -hmm. So every four years, there's a halvening, right? And, um, and so initially, every block gave you 50, 50 BTC. Then it was the case that it gave you 25. These days, you make 12 and a half. Uh, pretty soon, we're going to go down by another factor of two. So how did he pick that, right? So was it a good choice, that, that particular curve? And at times, it was, uh, uh, you know, it ran behind demand, right? Which was actually good for the coin holders, the, the, the coin kind of, you know, it kind of did this mooning thing where, it, you know, there's high demand, not enough coins, the price goes to the moon, that's okay. But at times it's too much. Like for Ethereum right now, Ethereum is minting way more than it should. It's, it's rewarding those miners uh, who are not doing all that much work uh, for, you know, with too many coins. And so, so that's a problem. They had a problem in Ethereum and now they're trying to make a whole bunch of uh, changes to try to change this. Um, well, in Avalanche, you can do the following. You can say, I want to push a special transaction onto the network. And this is a transaction that says, let's change the minting rate from, you know, let's say 1% a year to compensate for loss to uh, 0%. And if enough people agree with you, that is absolutely the kind of decision that you can make. That, that, that decision will be confirmed through the same avalanching uh, technology, the same avalanching uh, method. And, uh, and that will be the new law of the land. And, uh, you know, um, or the converse is possible too. It, it could well be that if you have just zero reward, then you won't have enough participants in the system. Then uh, you might want to increase it. And then once again, uh, that will require uh, a special transaction. And, you know, maybe you put it up to 2% and, uh, and try to get more nodes to stake and more nodes to jump in the, in the fray. And so, um, so it's, uh, it's kind of interesting. And uh, uh, in fact, more than kind of interesting, it, it frees us from having to make many of the decisions that other people end up making that are arbitrary and are then uh, proven wrong by just what happens in the real world. EOS is suffering from a bunch of decisions like this. The mm -hmm. RAM pricing is all kind of messed up. You know, it's subject to gaming and so on and so forth. Um, so, uh, or Ethereum has a bunch of other issues with it. For example, uh, the cost per, per instruction in Ethereum was picked essentially on, on one laptop, I gather, right? So people just measured the, how long it took to per perform different operations. And then they, they, uh, uh, they put different numbers, you know, di different numbers in based on how long it took on that laptop. Well, we can actually have it subject to governance so that people can have a meaningful pick here. So, uh, so these are pretty interesting. Uh, there are many other things we're planning to do. We, of course, want to support smart contracts, and uh, we have a very interesting technique for doing so. And uh, at the end of the day, Ava will be a platform, will be a payments rail and a contracting rail um, that is much faster than anything known, much, much, much more decentralized than anything known, um, and, uh, and way faster and more green than, than everything else in existence. So I foresee a time not very long from now where we end up seeing these coins consolidate. We'll end up seeing a whole lot of coins just throw in the towel. Uh, and these technologies are very hard to kill. They probably won't die. But a lot of communities will either pull their money out or will change their underlying technology because 
what's the point of trying to maintain you know fubar coins uh fubar, fubar <laughs> blockchain right it's uh, it's much more sensible to move on to a better platform and um, and there will be techniques for actually migrating your utxo set or your accounts balances to ava and uh, by doing so you'll get a, a huge huge boost so let me try and recap something here bitcoin consensus uh works because it takes advantage of some unique characteristics of the underlying data structure or the blockchain itself. There is no such uh, requirement for Avalanche. It's literally, you have this many choices, everyone signals what they want, the correct choice, the one that has the most out of, out of subsets should Avalanche to the correct answer, despite other people trying to stop it. Um, so it doesn't seem it's beholden to any given data structure outside of a, a DAG. So you can have that paralyzation of decision making, uh, is that it? Are, are there something I'm missing? Uh, that, that's correct. What you said is correct. The DAG is not the DAG for Avalanche is a performance optimization. Um, it's very different from the DAGs seen in other currencies. Just by the way, um, like the way the DAG is used in IOTA and the way the DAG is used in in uh, Avalanche are completely different. It's a very subtle difference, but it's it's a crucial difference. Um, so. Uh, uh, and, and instead of the DAG in Avalanche, we could have used any other data structure that gives us concurrency. So we could have used a multiset, for example, and it would have been just as fine, except multisets are a little hard to reason about. People don't really understand them. And, you know, the moment you say multiset, it gets confusing, whereas DAGs are kind of nice to visualize. Um, I don't know. So, uh, so yeah, we're going with DAG and AVA. Um, and, um, and so, and, and DAGs are very, very nice because they give us that concurrency. Like you and I could be working on the, let's say, north side of the DAG, uh, while uh, Corey is uh, working on the south side, and, uh, you know, and other people are working on the west side or whatever. So the, the DAG itself um, essentially creates uh, innate sharding, right? You can just yeah. ignore some portion of it and grow some other portion of it. So shards work really well. And, 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 and an embarrassing, par embarrassingly parallel situation where one yeah. worker doesn't have to care about what the other workers around it are doing uh, in regards to the decision that they're making. How do you, right. how, how does this work in a situation where that's not the case and you need to know information that's dispersed across the network or you have, like you have race conditions on those types of decisions? Yeah, of course we thought quite a bit about this. So one interesting thing is, um, uh, let's see, so uh, in typical blockchain protocols, you have to know the entire history of the, of the chain, right? That's right. how you bet a coin. Um, in this universe, in the in the avalanche universe, you only care about what we call the live edge, okay? Anything that's in the past that has been spent, you could actually prune if you wanted to. So um, so we we have the option in our nodes of pruning state and uh, and uh, ignoring the sort of the, the path to the the genesis vertex so if you are strapped for space you could just ignore it and uh, you have all the same guarantees all the same security for the live edge uh, even without having to check it all the way back to the the genesis vertex um, and for sharding if you decide that you want to keep only half the graph uh, then you are perfectly capable of doing so um, and uh, and and so and in fact, if you decide you know to be a lightweight client that cares only about its own nodes, that's perfectly reasonable as well. So how do you like that's that's the thing that's kind of throwing me off about this is uh, how do you join an un you know how do you join this network? Like I'm a node, I want to hop on. You don't need yeah. to know the entire history of everything, but how do you know the live edge? How do you know what edges are important? How do you know what's dependent? And how do you know the information you're pulling from the network? is correct. So you're set up with an initial state that is correct. Right, Colin. So there the idea is uh, very similar, or the attack that you're mentioning is very similar, or in fact, it's identical to what's known as an eclipse attack, right? So I come into Bitcoin. How do I know that the tail I got is the actual tail? How do I know that some idiot did not intercept my connection to the network and feed me it's a different chain than, than the one that the rest of the world has fed me. And in fact, in Bitcoin, there are the way they get around this is they have about nine or 10 seed nodes. And so you connect to one of the seeds and uh, the seeds themselves give you, uh, give you the different tails that they know of. And uh, hopefully none of them lie to you. And then you find the hardest, longest uh, tail end. 
and uh, that then defines the the blockchain for Bitcoin. And uh, it's going to be, of course, a very difficult uh, difficult process to try to attack this uh, for Bitcoin because you know you'd have to go to all of those seeds and somehow intercept what they do. But but let's not fool ourselves. It's just nine or ten seeds that they have, right? That that's what it comes down to. In in Ava. It's somewhat similar reasoning, but with much larger numbers. All you have to do to join the network is find one node that knows of other correct nodes. You, you got to find just one correct node. The join process is simply of going to a bunch of seeds and saying, hey, um, you know, I, I know you are part of the network. Who do you know who's part of the network? And then walking down that path. And if you walk down that path, and you're going to find all the other nodes that speak the same network, the same language, and you will find all of the other nodes that uh, have the appropriate staking amounts that have participated in the network, and you'll be able to vet uh, the current set that you're talking to. Uh, okay, but that node's informing you of other nodes, so you're also depending on that node as being an honest actor at some point, correct? So, it, it, like, um, am I misunderstanding that? So Let's you. Say you find one node and you're like, hey, give me, give me other nodes, right? Yeah. Um, bad, you... bad nodes could feed you any number of other bad nodes. They could eclipse you, right? They could right. create a Potemkin village for you. And you think, oh, look, there are like millions of nodes out here, but except they're all the same guy with the two horns and the trident in his hand, right? So, so that's, mm -hmm. that's the situation you want to avoid. Um, mm -hmm. And it's easy to detect those situations because as long as, as long as you can find one good guy who could connect you, connect you to the rest of the network. And once you connect to the rest of the network, you'll notice that there is a DAG. And as part of that DAG, there exists a whole set of correct nodes that have been vetted and have staked and so forth. And you know what? There is another DAG on the side that has nothing in common or very little in common, presumably. Well, nothing at the live edge that's in common. Uh, with this particular set of nodes, uh, and, and it turns out that all of the guys with the horns and the tridents and so forth, the red guys, the devils, um, those devilish uh, people are all on some side dag, and, uh, and that's not a difficult process to, to resolve. Ah, so yeah, that's something else that kind of like bothers me about things like IOTA, is like you could have part of the network inch towards basically its own value proposition, meaning that they're, they diverged at some point. It didn't seem like there was any way to really you reunite in a solid way. Um, the, you know, uh, like let's, let, you, you gave the example earlier, of, you know, you could only focus on one portion of the network as opposed to the other portion of the network. So mm -hmm. you're, you're caring about the North side and I'm caring about the South side. Um, now double spend would of course require that I communicate with the other side, but uh, what if the rules of the protocol itself are getting divergent? Is that something that we have to worry about? Um, that you're, you're touching upon two different things there. Let me, let me try to pick them apart. Uh, the first one has to do with IOTA. I'm, I'm a little afraid of saying anything about IOTA because, uh, because one of the designers of that system misunderstands everything and then, then gets uppity and goes crazy and, and sends, uh, that's not David. <laughs> David is good, Dom is good, but uh, come from beyond uh, misunderstands things on occasion, and and then and then you know when he misunderstands things, then the entire uh, entire IOTA army comes at, uh, after me, and uh, you know um, so so let's be clear about IOTA's uh, situation. So what I said so far about IOTA is so I like IOTA. The the DAG idea you know is a good idea, and um, and so there there are many other systems that use DAGs. Um, and uh, it's, it's a good idea. Um, in IOTA's case, what I think you're referring to is the problems they've had with the side tangle. They have, they have this, this thing on the side that some nodes seem to believe in and seem to issue transactions out of. And uh, they are convinced that this is some kind of a long sustained attack. And, and I'm not. Um, I'm, I'm wondering, and I've always been wondering this uh, for like you know, months on end now, but I don't know how to evaluate it. I suspect that IOTA might just have a buggy client somewhere. I don't. I can't imagine that somebody's spending all that time and energy creating a side tangle. So, um, so I think it's it's not really uh, um, it's not really a sort of fundamental or whatever it is. I think that that's sort of a different thing than what they think it is. Um, and um, and IOTA is 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 an interesting case. Its um, its correctness is still on on uh, unknown in my book and, and in the book of many other. 
uh, researchers. So, um, uh, so I think I'm going to leave IOTA at that. Um, the, the way we use the DAG is fundamentally different. And, um, and I think I kind of would need to sit down with CFB for 10 minutes to describe how it's different to him so that he understands that, oh, yeah, well, the, these guys are doing something in AVA that is not at all uh, IOTA-like. Um, IOTA makes a, a very simple, it just uses the DAG structure to, to encode the votes, whereas uh, AVA does not. And that, that makes a big difference in, in, in the final outcome. Um, so, uh, but the second thing you asked about was what happens when there is a divergence in the sets of rules chosen by the participants, right? And that's a big question. And we've seen that question come up in other contexts. Um, so, for example, uh, I don't know what's a good, well, you know, in Bitcoin case, right? What happens when, when your notions of what should be valid are different from mine? So, those are cases when forks develop. Right. And in fragile systems, systems that are subject to lots and lots of pre-chosen parameters, every single parameter is a divergence point. Every single parameter is a fork inducing change point. So you want to change the block size. Bam. You have this enormous debate, uh, bike shedding up the wazoo. People who used to be best friends are suddenly blocking each other. People are going on brigades. People are hiring troll squads. People are organizing dragon dens or whatever. And it's just a big mess. And, and fundamentally, that was because your protocol really relied on a huge tuple. And it turned out, in this case, the very first item in that tuple, the block size, created a divergence. There are many other things to disagree upon. And uh, at this rate, Bitcoin Cash is going to figure, <laughs> figure those out for us. So they seem to disagree on block size. They seem to disagree on features and so on and so forth. Um, one of the nice things we want to do in Avalanche is to reduce the number of such divergence points. And there are technological tricks for doing this, uh, where people pay the costs associated with a change um, uh, only if they are willing to, to go along with it. And that's perfectly okay for me to support things that you don't support, uh, and yet to be able to come to consensus on, on decisions pertaining to the, to the same. So that's something that we can do. Um, we believe in a large, large uh, majority of the cases, uh, but there will, of course, be cases where you know people, you know, some people want to go this way, and then some other people want to go in a mutually uh, exclusive direction, and so in those cases, there is no choice but to create a new network. I, I don't, there is nothing anyone can do about that. So that's just uh, uh, it's just a fact of life that one has to cope with. So you're going to let market forces decide, huh? Of course, as with anything. In fact, but we're gonna, we want to let the market forces decide in the network. So, if people want to want to have really heavyweight, very very heavyweight smart contracts, and not everybody wants to carry them, then at the moment you're out of luck, right? You you look at Ethereum and you say, I want to deploy this thing, and then they, they'll just say no, right? There isn't enough <laughs> gas you can pay for this uh, contract. And you're done, right? That's the end for you. Ethereum is not your platform anymore. So uh, that's not the same for Ava. That is not going to be the same same mechanism. So that's that's the interesting part. So you, we we won't have to turn people away. So I know we're getting towards towards a very we you know we're getting towards the end of the show. But um, you did mention smart contract support as being one of your goals. Um, one of the ways that Ethereum maintains consistency is that everybody on the network executes every every transaction call. Um, in this particular case, that that isn't necessarily going to be true, correct? Um, not everybody on the network is going to be executing everybody else's code uh, or scripts, I guess. Um, so my question is, how do you ensure that things like state management from uh, a VM like EVM or UAWESOME are correct across the network? Does it adhere to the same principles as simple transactions and value exchange? Or is there something, um, some other protections that you can implement, uh, such as bounties like Truebit would offer that would kind of be inherent to the protocol? What a lovely question, Colin. That was a that was incredibly insightful, and uh, and I do want to answer it, except I I'm afraid it's going to take another five to ten minutes, and uh, and also it will give away a lot of the cool stuff that we have in the works. So it, with your permission, I just want to say this: we we have a paper coming up. Uh, in the next two months or so. Uh, we call it the coin dynamics paper, the AVA coin dynamics paper. And um, 
and that's going to be the place where um, where this particular issue uh, is addressed. It's a very insightful question. It's exactly the right question, which is um, how do you agree, uh, or must you necessarily have everybody execute everything in tandem, Ethereum style? And uh, and if you don't, then how not? Right? How do you not ensure? How do you not require that? And so, um, so let me let me take that offline, if you would, and uh, put in a forward reference. Uh, there will be a Coin Dynamics paper. I'm really, uh, really proud of that paper. Um, it's uh, you know, in everything I've done in my career, I've I've typically brought this sort of a, uh, you know, like this fresh look, right? So um, uh, I don't know. People get sort of ossified in how they hmm. think about coins. You know, one coin, one scripting language, one chain. Uh, you know. And, uh, you know, this is how they should look. You should have your own VM. It should look like this and that. And, um, and I think my approach has been to sort of question even those basics. And, um, and so we did that with AvaCoin. And it's really, really fresh. It does almost everything differently. Um, and, uh, and yet, it gives you a very familiar environment at the end of the day. So um, uh, if we do everything right, which, you know, we, I believe we have, um, this Coin Dynamics paper will end up describing a universe where you can take your Solidity applications, things you've, you've done in Ethereum, and port them directly to Avalanche, byte by byte. Just take the same code, run it on Avalanche. And, uh, and it magically works in this new setting, but with far better guarantees. And, and you know what? You can also have more than one CryptoKitties application at the same time, which is a fascinating thing to be able to support in terms of performance. So, uh, so I'm really excited, and uh, so, so with your permission, let me not answer the question and just say, um, in in two months or so, there will be a Coin Dynamics paper that does exactly go into the great gory details of the technicals required to to handle that that question. Okay. Yeah, I actually like to have you back on the show at some point to discuss some of your progress. So, um, yeah, that'd be that'd be a great thing to kind of bring up at that time too. Um, I have another. I have another question here that, I, that, yep, that we've been it. we've been we've touched on a few times ancillarily, but haven't gone into the details of it. And that is, um, all all open permissionless blockchains that have some type of value associated with them um, have some type of incentive mechanism built in through stake. With with you know Bitcoin, it's upfront staking of real world energy at the chance of solving the correct uh, you know cryptographic puzzle to then submit a block with proof of stake consensus mechanisms you have uh like on-chain asset staking so that it allows incentives and disincentives what type of thing are you using in terms of like the incentive mechanisms for people to do the right thing within avacoin oh great question also so you know it takes a little while to get into to get the right foundation and then all the good questions come out at the very very end um so yeah. okay so in in ava we're going to be using stake with minting so the way this is going to work is um, uh, so uh, uh, to participate in the network, people have to have some skin in the game. I don't want everybody, you know, every Joe Schmo uh, with his, you know, fake uh, sock puppets try to participate and, uh, and potentially interfere with the network. We want the participants to have some, some economic incentive. Anybody can join the network to listen, but to, to have decision power, you have to show that you have committed some resources to the network. So that, that is going to happen in the form of stake. If you wanted to have a similar, similar sort of proof of uh, skin in the game in Bitcoin, you would have bought miners. In this case, you tie down some resources. Uh, there's a staking period. So stake is going to be the staking amount is people ask me how much is it going to take to, to stake? Um, at the moment, we have we have a name for it. It's called Capital Delta. Okay, so um, no, nothing has been set in stone yet. Uh, it's just a Greek letter at the moment. Um, and uh, so, if you can show Capital Delta, you're part of the network. And um, so, with that, you you get to be consulted on every decision on on every decision. Not necessarily every every decision, but you know everything you hear of, you can be polled for. So um, and you play a role in determining how it goes, right? So, so that's nice. Um, and, uh, and the tie down period for your capital Delta coins is some other thing that people ask me about. It's going to be tau. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so it's so another Greek letter. Um, just so I, I think I know approximately how long tau is going to be. I think I want it to be around about a, about a week. So you're not going to tie it down for four months. 
this is not a fragile protocol um, that that has to have stability and commitment and you know for four four months or whatever. It's just going to be one week, so you know, or around one week. So um, so you commit for one week, some amount of resources, um, and at the end of that that period, you are guaranteed to get your resources back. You could have you know you could have attacked the system, you could have done all sorts of things, but um, um, but we are not going to take away your coins for any reason. So uh, systems, proof of stake systems that people are are using uh, with classical consensus protocols necessarily end up having to punish misbehaviors. So if you look at Casper, it has this notion mm-hmm. of slashing slashing conditions. And if you ever what we call equivocate, that is, you say something to one person, say it's opposite to the other person. If you ever do that, well, that's really bad behavior in those systems, and they have to make sure that you don't do that, and therefore they have to punish you by taking your coins away, which is really a problem. And why is the problem? Because you can have software bugs, and uh, we're guaranteed to have them. There are infinitely many bugs out there, right? So uh, you can have software bugs that cause you to suddenly lose a bunch of your coins, and um, and that is really sort of disconcerting. I would not want to build a new financial system on such a fragile or, or so you know I, I like technologies where I can go to sleep at night knowing that nothing bad is going to happen to to me or, or or things that I set aside so the coins should be safe from tampering or from protocol you know usurp usurping by protocol so you'll get your coins back at the end of the tau period um, plus a slight reward and that's how minting is going to be done uh, the amount of that reward is an annualized rate of return known as uh, R and uh, or rho, I think is what it is. In any case, um, so uh, all these Greek letters are are unbound at the moment. We're going to determine what their default values ought to be when we initially roll the coin out. They'll be frozen for some time. uh, And then after that, they'll be subject to governance. Uh, When I say subject to governance, I don't mean arbitrary changes are possible. So in fact, I actually don't want or don't like systems where the system can jump from any different, from one configuration to a completely different configuration all at the same time. That is not, that is not quiescent in my mind. That is not, uh, that's it's not chaotic. A system. Yeah, it's chaotic. By definition. Right? <laughs> yeah, financial systems, you want them to, to be somewhat, I don't know what the opposite of chaotic is. Um, uh, I don't know if I, if I want to use the word orderly. Um, but uh, in this context, you want them to, to, to move with some inertia. So, and, and you also want to understand the limits. So every one of these, uh, these limits, these um, uh, parameters, capital, delta, tau, et cetera, they, can, they are subject to change, but they should be subject to only so much change per time period so that uh, people who don't like the new decision have time to, to exit in, a, in an orderly fashion. So it has to be a nice system to use. I suspect the feature combinations we have uh, is, is just, uh, it's just right to, to sort of give rise to a pretty nice system, very, very predictable, very safe from a, sort of a, somebody who's got money invested in it perspective. Um, Harmonized. <laughs> if you, in, in the world of like, uh, like uh, surface optimization, you'd say smooth and, and well-behaved. Right, smooth. Smooth is a good term. Yes, we want we want to avoid discontinuous behaviors when it comes to uh, uh, to, to critical parameters like this. So anyway, so yeah, that's how minting is going to be done. Uh, if you stake, you get some money um, at the end of every every tau period, and uh, you get to restake if you like, or uh, or take the money out, or whatever you want to do with it. All right, uh, I think let's uh, let's start to wrap on that one. That was been that's been a very insightful discussion on. Uh, how AVA will work and how Avalanche works as its underlying consensus mechanism. Uh, is there any type of question or comment that you'd like to like that you'd like to put forth to our audience that we didn't get to ask you about? No, I think this is great. We're uh, um, it's, we're living through a very exciting period in in cryptocurrency evolution. Um, I think uh, we ended up having what eighteen hundred different coins. Uh, most of these are worthless, weird things. Some of them are securities, which are different. There's, there, there's something else. Uh, but the, the sort of the new infrastructures that people are proposing, um, all but one of them, all but Ava, are uh, are coming from you know either the the classical uh, setting or the uh, the Nakamoto setting, and uh, and suddenly we have a new option. And people who sort of pushed f- forth the Nakamoto idea. 
they ended up pushing forth a lot of narratives around it about how the network decides, how the network routes around this and that. And, um, and in many cases, what they said uh, wasn't exactly right. Right? So we've seen this time and time again. Bitcoin does not achieve social consensus, right? It doesn't find social consensus. It does not, it's not geared for it. It's, it's, it, in fact, can easily break apart uh, if there's a fracture at that level. Um, and, uh, and there are many other things that, uh, that are sort of pushed forth in sort of narrative form, but aren't really there in technical form. So the funny thing is, uh, for Ava, they're there. Like they, Ava will find the social consensus if there is one to be found. It will technically do so. And, uh, and there are a bunch of other things that, uh, that it can do um, that are in the sort of same vein of, you know, this got said about Bitcoin, but Bitcoin didn't really do it. And here is something that, that might. And so, so I'm excited. It's a new era, I think, in the evolution of these currencies. We'll see a, level of, of a year of consolidation next year. We'll also see other people roll out proof of stake coins, um, and uh, and I think in that time frame we're going to hopefully have um, Ava come out and uh, and show the world uh, what it's like to have finality that's on the order of a second or two, and what it's like to have uh, really 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 high performance on the chain or on the DAG I should say, uh, as well as a set of features that uh, that really you know usurp everything else or that really sort of supersede everything else. Uh, that's been out there. So I'm really excited. Me too. Oh, oh there's yeah. one other thing. Oh, guys, oh, gosh, <laughs> almost forgot. One other thing. Okay, so this is important. I should really, I should really nail this. So, um, so we have this thing, right, the Ava coin, and it's going to be, it has the potential to be incredibly decentralized, right? And what do I mean by that? If I look at Bitcoin, I see 19 miners and mining pools, okay? That's the level of decentralization. You know, sure, we can get into details of how many, you know, like those mining pools are really actually, you know, more people, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, and that becomes an esoteric discussion of its kind, which is, you know, yeah, they could really break apart and reform, etc. But maybe not, you know, they, um, uh, it's not clear that they would actually be able to detect malfeasance by the pool operator. We've seen this time and time again, the Bitcoin gold attacks uh, just happened where uh, people attack the currency and none of the participants, none of the miners even knew that they were being used as part of an attack. They are just not geared for it. But in any case, let's see that to them. Uh, you know, maybe it's more, but it's not that much more. Okay, so maybe, you know, there are a hundred entities out there, or maybe there are a thousand, um, but you know, that's, that's what we're, we top out at. Um, if I look at uh, Ethereum, I see 11 miners and mining pools um, defining the entire chain. If I look at EOS for, you know, all of the, you know, people make fun of EOS for a bunch of reasons, but at the end of the day, they have 21 entities that are producing blocks. So they, in many ways, have more decentralization than others. So um, suddenly we have AVA, and AVA has the potential to have, to give an equal voice to tens of thousands to millions of participants. So anybody can stake, and anybody can then participate. And, and anybody can have as much voice as Jihan Wu. So, you know, Jihan is, is great at building hardware. He's wonder, he's a brilliant guy. I've met him, he's fantastic, very well-spoken guy. And, um, and, and, and he's great at building these miners that go in and compute these hashes. But when it comes to serializing transactions, he is just like everybody else, okay? He puts one transaction before another. That's all he does as a miner. All of that hashing is where he spends all his energy. But at the end of the day, his contribution to the chain is as simple as what I just said. He just serializes transactions like everyone else. And I too could do that. And you too could do that. And in fact, I believe you too should do that. And if you did, that would create a much better world where everyone is participating in defining what happened, not leaving it up to a specialized minor class. That specialized miner class creates a lot of issues for coins. I mentioned the, the value leak from, from stores of value, but there are other problems as well. Like why, why, are there, why is there even a different class of entity in my network? Why aren't we all aligned? So, uh, so leaving all that aside, um, Ava has the potential to give a voice to anybody and to have people participate in a system of unprecedented decentralization levels. So you can have millions of participants in this thing easily and that's a fascinating world that I hope we'll be able to explore. Intuitively, it feels like uh, the avalanche uh, grows in efficiency the 
the more you have that level of decentralization coming to consensus from the disparate uh, distributed local state people who have their own opinion on what's going on is better the further the like the the more you have that initial set right the, the larger number in is the quicker you get to the final consensus if there seems to be like intuitively speaking especially with like the the more options you have you should also come to uh, you should also avalanche to the correct decision quicker i'm not sure well technically um the the there is a parameter, the number of rounds, and it does grow as you have uh, you have more nodes, but it doesn't grow linearly. In fact, it grows way, way sublinear. It grows as log. Okay. So, um, uh, so it's it's going to you know if you have uh, ten thousand people, it might be you know eleven rounds, and if you I, I forget the numbers now. If you have a uh, hundred thousand, it's like fifteen ish, if I'm not mistaken. Man, no, oh, that's too much. Maybe it's 13. I don't know. I forget. But, you know, it, it, around 17 rounds is the largest number that I've seen. If you, I think that's for tens of millions, if I'm not mistaken. So, yes, it grows very slowly. Um, and there is great value in having more people participate in the system. It's uh, uh, They're not necessarily adding to the speed. I don't think they make it faster. Uh, but they do make it much more resilient. Yeah, it's and, more robust. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. It, it's, they push back against anybody who might acquire wealth and try to attack the system it does sound like though that increases network traffic quite a bit no the the, the load of an, of an individual well, net, network traffic maybe but the load of an individual through rounds doesn't grow with the size of the network it does not that's right so oh, the, okay. it's it's you you end up you end up sampling some number of people like five to ten uh some number of rounds so uh uh, as the network grows, you know, suppose the number of re- the number of people you sample is going to be the same. Um, and if you go from 11 rounds to 13 rounds, you know, that's only uh, whatever it is. To, uh, it's going to be, to, sorry, it's going to be 20 extra packets for you. So that's not much at all. As long as you don't have closed loops within the network, you sh- it, it, it should come well, to a consensus. That's the thing is for you, I'm thinking on a global scale, the number, the amount of network traffic kind of increases. Um, it, it's which, linear. You know, it's, an it's, issue. Linear. It's, it's probably not that big a deal. I'm just kind of like, kind of curious. No, no, let, let's, how, let's characterize it because it's important. Um, so uh, Colin, it's, um, so for classical consensus protocols, okay? So if you were to use Lamport, Liskov style protocols, like what's used in Hyperledger, um, I'm gonna try to make a decision in that, in those protocols. And in every case, people I speak to could be lying. So then what I have to do is ask everybody and then they have to ask everybody themselves. So if everybody has has to ask everybody else, you get you get stuck with an N squared protocol. So N squared seems like, okay, well, it's just a square. Well, no, squares, <laughs> yeah, squares grow really fast. Yeah, so yeah. if you only have a, if you have as few as a hundred, a uh, hundred uh, validators, then suddenly you have, uh, what is it? A hundred times a hundred is 10,000 packets flying out there. And it's just, a, you know, it's just a lot of communication. Uh, in Avalanche, I think we just did the math a second ago. If you have, um, if you have, uh, you know, about a hundred thousand participants, uh, you ended up needing about 75 messages per decision. That's it's, uh, and, and if you have more, like it, it's going to grow a little bit. But uh, but that growth is uh, is uh, is proportional to the log of the size of the network. So um, uh, in aggregate, so the number that's n squared for classical is O of n for um, for avalanche. So the yeah. sum total number of packets that the network must bear is just O of n, and the energy required for let's say a million messages is is a tiny fraction. Of uh, of what you know, say Bitcoin or Ethereum consume per second. Yeah. So it's a very efficient protocol. Yeah, and if there were a, a Moore's law for network growth, and I don't know if there is, I, I would guarantee that that's lower than that. So that's yes, of course. Yeah. yeah, and there is yes, yes, there is a Moore's law equivalent for network speeds. So uh, yeah. It's... All right, let's uh let's before we do dive into another tangent, which we could easily do, let's uh, let's wrap this up. So thank you, uh, Dr. Gunsarir, for coming on the show and 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 helping us figure out how this works and uh, what's coming into the future. For our audience, if you enjoyed this, please click like, subscribe, tell your friends, share it on Twitter. Uh, you can find us on all platforms: Spotify, TheBitcoinPodcast dot com, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So thank you. Great, thank you for having me. This was a lot of fun. Yeah, thanks.